Welcome to the deep dive video. And I feel I need to explain this. Every week I do a number of different videos. After I get done with the main videos that I do, I go through and I look at all the charts and those charts that I really didn't talk about that much, I put into this video and I call it the deep dive video because we have to look deeper to see if we're getting any messages from these other charts. Even though they're not necessarily speaking loudly to us right now, we still want to look them over. Also, there are some charts that are unique to this particular video. This is being prepared from Monday, March 25th. The first chart is a chart that I usually show in the daily videos. It's called the ulcer index. And when it's going up, that usually means the market's going down because ulcer, people are really freaked out about that since most people are long in the market. But really, since the you know, mid part of November, we've been pretty flat with this reading. So it's not really changing all that much. I decided not to show it in the daily videos because we're pretty much seeing the same thing day after day. Then this is another chart that I quite often use, but since the beginning of 2024 has not been that helpful. This measures risk on versus risk off. When this is going up, that means we're more risk on and folks are getting into more of the high beta stocks or the growth stocks. And then when this is going down, that means they're getting out of the high beta stocks and getting into more conservative types of stocks that tend to hold up better when we're going down or sideways. Well, if you look over here on the right, since the beginning of 2024, we've just been chopping more or less sideways. So we haven't been really getting much insight from this chart. Then this is a chart of the VIX, and this is unique just to this video. I do have the VIX on here, but then I turn it invisible. Over top of the VIX, I have a 50-period exponential moving average. And this goes all the way back to 2004. And we want to have an idea, what is the big range of the VIX? When the VIX was first designed, it was meant to be used for 12 to the downside, meaning there's no fear, and 20 to the upside, meaning that, meaning that there's a lot of fear in the market. Well, it doesn't stay within that static range. When we went through the great financial crisis, the VIX went up to a much higher range. Then as we were coming out of that, we went into a lower range. After the COVID plunge, a higher range. And now we're coming down and it looks like we're setting a lower range. We don't use this to make decisions. This is mainly just for information. Then we want to keep an eye on how fast is the mix, the VIX moving up or down. This is what I used to measure this with is an RSI based on nine periods. And we look for extreme positive or negative readings. Even though we've been going up and down with this indicator, we're not getting anything extreme right now. Then this is a chart that's kind of floated in and out of some of the daily videos. This is a correlation between the VIX and the S&P 500. Sometimes when we go up above this dashed line, that's showing us that the market's getting rather nervous. If you look down on the bottom, typically that will mark some kind of a short to intermediate term top. Well, we've been dropping down now and we're more in a neutral range right now. So there hasn't been a need to show this chart. Then we look at the move index on top, which measures the volatility of bonds. And that's really been dropping off. And as stocks have been going up, we are seeing the VIX really dropping off as well. On the bottom is what I mainly pay attention to, where we're seeing a pretty strong correlation between the price of bonds and the price of stocks. But then this shows a little bit different message here. We do a ratio between the move in the VIX and the move index. And when this is going down with the moving average, the red line, that means that stocks are becoming less and less volatile and they're usually going up at that point. Well, ever since the beginning of 2024, we're seeing the moving average continuing to go up. Now we're seeing the VIX itself drop to lower levels. It had been slowly inching up over time, but this past week it's been dropping down. If that continues, we'll probably see a decrease in this overall ratio. This is one type of fear gauge that we look at when we compare bonds it, different kinds of bonds with each other. But since the beginning of 2024, this measurement has pretty much been chopping sideways, not giving us a lot of insight. Now, this one has really been moving a lot more. This is another fear gauge. When this is going down, that means fear is decreasing. And this just keeps going down, down, down. We're getting some pretty good indications from other charts that we look at. So I haven't been including this chart. Then we just want to know, how far are we above the previous all-time high that was set in early January 2022? As of Friday's close, we're up 8.64% above the previous all-time high for the S&P. 
Then stockcharts.com has a thing called technical alerts. And I go through all these alerts for each day in the daily videos. What I try to do here is take a shot of all of the different alerts that we saw during the week. When we see a lot of green or blue, that's positive. When we see red, that's negative. And the first part of the week, we were pretty subdued. Then the Fed came out and the market seemed to really like what they had to say. And now we're seeing a lot of green and blue here in Wednesday and Thursday session. We did decline a little bit, but we just had one little old thing be triggered in Friday's session, which was a BPI cross for the industrial sector, which has been showing some strength. Then I look at five main indexes. Now the S&P 500 is the the foundation of everything that I analyze and all the strategies that I teach and what I go over in my classes. But we also want to keep an eye on other indexes. In addition to the S&P 500, we want to watch the QQQs. There's a lot of stocks in the NASDAQ 100 or QQQs that are also in the S&P 500. We want to keep an eye on the Dow. We want to keep an eye on the mid caps and the small caps. And then stockcharts.com rates them on a score of zero to 100, the higher the score, the better looking the chart. It's trying to remove the emotion so that you don't have to look at a chart and come to some kind of a conclusion based on what you think is happening. This tries to be more objective. Coming in first place, which had dropped out of first place for a while, and now is coming back into first place, are the QQQs of the NASDAQ 100, coming in at 87.2. In second place is the S&P 500. There's a lot of carryover stocks in both indexes. It comes in at a score of 82.9. The mid-caps have been showing some strength really since the end of January. And they're setting recent all-time highs with the index. And so we're seeing some strength here coming in at 79.9. Then we see the Dow, which had been stronger. And sometimes it's getting a little weaker. This is one of those weaker periods right now coming in fourth place at 66.2. And then the IWM, this is the Russell 2000 small cap ETF, and it's in last place at 64.1. And the small caps have really been lagging. And now that the Fed may be pivoting to more of a dovish stance, there's a lot of humming around and wondering, okay, is now going to be the time when small caps start to improve? We're not really seeing that yet. We're watching for that. I don't personally invest in small caps or small cap indexes, but in a more healthy environment, we will typically see the small caps doing better than they have been doing. Then we look at some short-term charts. This is a short-term rainbow. Short-term means it goes from 10 periods up to 50 periods with a simple moving average. The colors are changed to kind of make it look cool. All of the lines are going up, prices above all the lines. And so the short-term trend is comfortably positive currently. And then this is a double and triple exponential moving average study. The blue line, and they're pretty much on top of each other right now. There's a blue line and a green line. The blue line goes faster. The triple moves faster than the double. And we have price currently above both. So this is also confirming that the short-term trend is comfortably positive. Then we look at an intermediate term rainbow going from 50 periods up to 100 periods. The lines are going up and not jagging around each other and prices above all of the lines. So the intermediate term trend continues to be positive. Then we look at an anchored moving average and we're not near it right now. This was last October's low, but this is different than a regular moving average where a moving average looks at the price right now and then goes back, let's say 10, 15, 20, 100, 200 periods and then does its calculation that way. An anchored moving average goes back to some point, and this was the previous all-time high, and then runs that moving average going forward. And so that's how it's different from another moving average. But since we're far above it right now, I haven't been showing this chart. We have a Connors RSI. We have a lot of oscillators that, that I follow here. And this is another oscillator where we're looking for an extreme positive or negative reading. On a day in and day out basis, this thing is really quite schizophrenic, but we don't get a lot of extreme readings very often and we're not getting one now. And this is another double and triple exponential moving average study. I did show this earlier in the week. There's a couple of things we can take away from this chart and they're both positive. First of all, we are above both the red line and the blue line. Also, the red line is above the blue line because the red line goes faster than the blue line. So that means the intermediate term trend is stronger for right now.
Then we look at a 50 period moving average study. I plot both a simple and exponential moving average, and we're well above both of these moving averages now. So there's been no need to show this. If we start to see some weakness and we fall below the 20 period moving averages, this would be the next line of support that we would start to follow. We also look at a 100 period moving average study. This is more intermediate to long-term and we're well above both of the moving averages here. And then we also measure how far above are we from the 200 day simple moving average. As of Friday's close, we're 13.79% above the 200 day moving average. Then this is standard deviation. It doesn't measure direction, it measures speed. As we've been going up, we're seeing the standard deviation pick up a little bit, but we're still below the moving average. When an, either an index or a stock really gets moving, you'll see the standard deviation really start to spike up. And we are going up a little bit, but not really spiking right now. Then we wanna keep an eye on the S&P 100 and compare it with the S&P 500. They're both coming off of setting recent all-time highs and not really diverging from each other. This is just a measurement going back to the low that we set in October. And so far, as of Friday's close, we're up 21.63% from that October low. Now, I measured this, and it, it's an intraday measurement, so you might see something a little bit different according to what measurements you might look at. This is the Pring bottom fissure, which is not generate, generating a signal right now. When we're really going down, sometimes this can be helpful to help us find some kind of a bottom in the market. Well, we continue to go up, so... This indicator hasn't been helpful. The mass index also is not generating a signal right now. It starts to generate a signal when we get to the red dash line or the blue line, and we're far away. Then we look at a long-term rainbow going from 50 periods up to 250 periods. All the lines are going up, price is going up, and price is above all, all of the lines. So the long-term trend is positive. This is a daily special K chart. This is a long-term oscillator. We don't get very many signals here. So I mentioned this, but I don't show this chart very often. We are still positive on the daily chart. We're still negative on the weekly chart, though. And then we look at a weekly chart of the S&P on top, a weekly chart of the German DAX in the middle, and then we see that there's a pretty strong correlated relationship between the two. Both the German index as well as the EU is doing well right now, and the S&P 500 is doing well right now. So they're correlating with each other fairly strong. Then we look at the 10-year yield in the U.S. and we subtract the German 10-year yield. Because U.S. rates are higher, that gives us a positive answer. So we're above this red line. And then sometimes we can match it up with the U.S. dollar index. But right now, that relationship is pretty much neutral. So we're not really getting any insight from this chart. Then there's a thing called the Hindenburg Omen. We had one of these triggered the first part of February. We need to see another spike up here for that to be confirmed. That did not happen within 20 trading days. And there's been no new signal that's been triggered. No matter what the perma bears say, no matter how close we get, another signal has not been triggered at least yet. Then we look at some different support and resistance levels. This is called an itchy moku cloud. Sometimes I call it the itchy and scratchy cloud. Where all this is, is just a set of moving averages that are plotted based on current price and then shifted forward. Sometimes when we're going up and fall back, this may provide support. If we're going down and we bounce up, this may provide resistance. We're far away from the cloud now. This is an indicator that I created decades ago for a specific trading system. I stopped doing that system, but I kept the indicator. This is a 20 period simple moving average of the open high, low and close. This produces a mini rainbow. Now, sometimes when we're going up and we drop back, one of these lines may end up providing support. If we're going down and we start to see a bit of a bounce, one of these lines may act as resistance. We can also look at the general direction of the mini rainbow itself, and it's clearly going up, and that's supporting the upward trend. Then we have some broad market measures. I mainly look at the VIX, and I do a lot of studies based on that. The corresponding measurement for the NASDAQ 100 is called the VIXEN. You just got to love that name. And we have a lot of crazy data up here on the bar chart. If anything, I usually follow the line chart down below, but I don't follow this one all that much. I mainly focus on the VIX. And then we look at the S&P on top, and then we have a ratio between the QQQs or NASDAQ 100 and the Dow down here. And we look down below to see what is the correlation between this ratio and the S&P. And it's pretty neutral right now. When we get a high reading, that means they're going in the same direction at the same time. 
when we're down here, that means it's neutral. If we go all the way in the opposite direction, that means they're going in opposite directions of each other. Then we want to keep an eye on the bank ETF. After showing some improvement, we pretty much have been going sideways here. Even though the financial sector has been pretty strong lately and setting new all-time highs recently, this is the area that's showing some weakness. We have the New York Community Bank, which is a regional bank. So we want to keep an eye on the regional banking ETF. And then we take a ratio of that ETF with the financial sector, showing that the financial sector is doing okay, but the regional banking ETF continues to really underperform. Then we want to look at home construction, which is very interest rate sensitive. And this has really been outperforming bonds. We keep an eye on QQQs to the three to seven year bond. And this is showing that the Qs are outperforming bonds as well. And we want to compare the Eurozone stocks in the EU. They're also outperforming US three to seven year bonds. And then I have a couple of rate of change charts. I just use these for information and I only show them in this video. We go back 250 periods and we are in a solid uptrend. This is a longer term look at that same chart, also showing that we're in an uptrend. Now we're above this blue line and there are times when we get to this level when this mark may mark some kind of an extreme reading, but we'll use other indicators to help tell us that. And we look at bonds, we look at the one to three year bond and we compare it with the three to seven year bond. And this is based on price. Now, we saw a real shift this past week, and we're starting to see this ratio going down, meaning that interest rates may be going down as well. This had been going back up, which was causing some concern to the market. The fact that this is now going back down means that it's more interest rate friendly for stocks. Here's an inverse of that same kind of thing, where we look at seven to 10-year bonds and compare them with three to seven-year bonds, showing that this is still having a tendency to go down overall. Then we look at the TLT, which is the long-term bond ETF. That's in blue. <clears throat> and we compare it with the S&P 500 that's in red. And we're seeing a little bit of the strengthening here of the long-term relationship, but it has become a lot weaker than it had been. We're also kind of weak right now in the short term when we do a 10-period correlation with each other. And then we look at the QQQs, which is in black, and the TLT. And they're having a pretty strong tendency to go in opposite directions, but it is starting to get a little bit stronger. Now we're coming up more into this neutral area. And we want to keep an eye on the yield curves, especially these top two. This is the 10 to the two year and the 10 to the three month. They remain inverted. When they go back to being normal, that's when we usually start the countdown to see if we're going to go into a recession or not. And then we look at TIPS, which are Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. These are what folks want to get into in a rising interest rate environment, and they tend to really outperform at that time. Now that we've been seeing interest rates starting to come down, they're jockeying around a little bit here, but they've really been flattening out. It's a little more pronounced when we look at TIPS and then look at further out bonds, where TIPS are more attractive when interest rates are going up. We saw a real big decline when we topped out last October with interest rates and started to come down. We haven't really turned down yet here with this ratio. If interest rates start to fall, we would expect to see this ratio continue to fall as well. And then we look at one to three month T-bills, which is pretty much cash, and we compare it with three to seven year bonds. It had been going back up, but since we're seeing a shift now, possibly in interest rates, this ratio is beginning to go back down. And then we look at stocks and compare them with three to seven year bonds. We're continuing to outperform with bond, stocks over bonds. And when we're up in this area, this means the market is anticipating a soft landing. And then I have a thing called possible positive scenarios. These usually are something that can help us quite a bit when we're really going down and trying to establish some kind of a bottom that we may bounce up out of. But these charts still can be helpful on a day in and day out basis. However, I don't show all of the charts, so the rest of the charts I show here. This is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 200-day simple moving average. I have another study like this, but I'm looking for something different here. This is looking more like an oscillator when we look for an extreme positive or negative reading. Also, when we're above 50, that's more positive. So we are positive here and not getting an extreme reading currently. Then we look at the stocks above their 50 period moving average. Also, we're above 50 and we are starting to go back up and not extreme. We keep an eye on the mid caps, also showing some improvement here. The small caps are improving a little bit, but they are lagging behind. Then we look at a 19 day exponential moving average of the advanced decline ratio for the S&P. We're above zero and we continue to advance based on price as well as volume. And we use this like an oscillator. And right now we're not getting an extreme positive or negative reading. 
Then we keep an eye on the two-year treasury yield, which is continuing to go up for the time being. Sometimes when this spikes up and starts to come down, that will give good short to intermediate term support to the S&P. We also look at a ratio between the staples and the S&P 500. Overall, this has been going down. That's been giving support, support to the S&P. It's kind of chopping around right now. And if this continues to fall, that would likely give more support to the S&P 500. Thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. I hope you're having a great weekend. And there's one more video that I will prepare called the What to Watch video. In this video, I went through the charts that I'm not watching all that much. In the What to Watch video, I'm going through the charts that I'm really watching right now.